Chronicle of the Times Vintage Voices from 1738 to 1741 Welcome to Chronicle of the Times. In today's episode, we explore the Georgian world of 1738 to 1741. The big news is the incredible frost with its corresponding impact on life and limb. And the evil highwayman Dick Turpin is caught. And the terrible case of the ten-year-old boy who tried to kill his family. Our recipes include a rather excellent gooseberry wine and how to make a bride's cake. Our agony aunt section includes the astonishment followed by revulsion regarding a man whom Hen discovers to not be all that she appeared. And our gossip section includes the daily list of criminals to be hanged, and the shocking story of one man's brutal crime against a poor woman he believed to be a witch. All this and more in today's episodes of Vintage Voices. We so very much hope that you enjoy the show. About 1738 to 1741. We commence today's episode of Vintage Voices with a quick review of some of the events taking place between 1738 and 1741. 1738. The Great Frost of 1739 to 1740, an unusually harsh winter across Europe. At that time, it was the second coldest recorded European winter over the previous 500 years. Welsh seaman Robert Jenkins presents a pickled ear, his own pickled ear, stating it to have been caused by the Spanish. Thus begins the war of Jenkins' ear of Great Britain against Spain from 1739 to 1742. The start of the Methodist movement through a spiritual experience by John Wesley. 1739. On the 7th of April, 1739, Dick Turpin is hanged. The Foundling Hospital in London, a place for the education and maintenance of orphans, is established in London. 1740. Hartford College in Oxford is founded. Grog begins to be issued in the Royal Navy. 1741. George II orders the British army to prepare for an invasion of Prussia to defend his electorate of Hanover. Heads of State. The monarch is King George II. The Prime Minister is Robert Walpole from 1721 to 1742. Advertisement. From the Ipswich Journal, June 1749, this is to give notice that there will be a main of cocks fought at Edward Mandy's at Downham Bridge, the gentleman of Ely against the gentleman of Norfolk, to wait the 28th and the 29th of the instant of June 1749. What people are talking about. One of the biggest stories of the day was the capture of the notorious Dick Turpin. Despite later romanticised versions of his exploits, Turpin was actually a cruel and violent highwayman who had no compunction to kill anybody who got in his way. Whole roads and communities were put in fear because of Turpin and it was considered a very happy day indeed when he was captured. 
From the Derby Mercury, March 1738, Country News. Yesterday, John Palmer, alias Dick Turpin, was tried here and convicted upon two several indictments for horse stealing. The evidence was clear and full, and the prisoner had little or nothing to say in his defence. He was proved by two witnesses from Essex to be the notorious Richard Turpin, one of whom was Smith, who taught him to write, and he himself owned his name so to be, but said he was not the Richard Turpin he was taken for, but another person of the said name. He said he had been a butcher in Lincolnshire, and failing there, had retired into this county and took upon himself the name of Palmer. He did not apprehend any danger from the full accusation of shooting a farmer's cock, and therefore tamely submitted to the constable's authority. And after he was charged with horse-stealing, he did not attempt to escape, lest, if he did not succeed, an inquiry might be made after him and a discovery made of who he was. His necessity on jail forced him to get a fellow prisoner to write the letter which he signed, and which pulled off the mask and discovered him. Since he was suspected to be Turpin, the whole country have flocked here to see him, and have been very liberal to him, insomuch that he has had wine constantly before him till his trial, and tis said the jailer has made a hundred pounds by selling liquor to him and his visitors. Though the fellow has made a great noise in the world, he'll now die like a dog. A vast number of wages have been lost on this account. From the Derby Mercury, April 1739, York Castle. Last Saturday, Richard Turpin and John Stead were executed here for horse stealing. The latter died very penitent, but the former behaved with the greatest assurance to the last. It was remarkable that as he mounted the ladder, his right leg trembled, on which he stamped it with an air, and undoubted courage looked round about with him, and after speaking a few words to the topsman, he threw himself off the ladder and expired in about five minutes. Before his death, he declared himself to be the notorious highwayman Richard Turpin, and confessed to the topsman a great number of robberies which he had committed. It is a requirement for all Englishmen to discuss the weather. We raise our children from an early age to talk about the weather, but in 1739 this was actually a topic worth discussing. The infamous great frost was so cold that rivers froze over that had never before in living memory froze. From the Derby Mercury, January 1739, the Great Frost, Newcastle. The frost still continues so strong and in all appearance likely to hold that most of the handicraft tradesmen in these parts are deprived of following their several employments by the severity of the cold. The famous River Tyne, on which depends most of our trade, is frozen hard, that all manner of diversions are daily pursued thereon, as sliding, jumping, running, football, dressing of meat, and selling all kinds of liquors in tents, and it is like a fair by the concourse of both sexes. By letters from several parts of this and adjacent counties, we have advice that the greatest quantity of snow have fallen in these parts, the like of which has not been in the memory of the oldest person living, much greater than in 1684 or in 1715. Many by-roads have been measured upwards of 14 feet 
perpendicular, which has rendered all manner of carriage impractical. The water mills and their receivers are all frozen and so loaded with ice that it is impossible to disgorge them of their concealed burden, so that this part of England has a near resemblance of Norway, both for cold and the quantity of snow. The frost impacted the poor the most, with difficulty staying warm and the costs of fuel. But it has been said that no place was hit harder than Ireland. This heartbreaking news account was a, a rarity in the English papers. From the Ipswich Journal, March 1741, Ireland. I have nothing to add to the former but to inform you of the misery of this poor, wretched country, which is really more than I can express. I am sorry not to be a daily eyewitness to the constant melancholy state of the poor who die for want and disorders bred by the unwholesome diet that they are obliged to eat, and this in the city. But as to the country, there is so much worse. Having occasioned some time since to go about sixteen miles from the town in the road, so many miserable objects melted my eyes, such as some dead and others dying by the ditch side, whose groans and cries for want of bread pierced my heart and struck such a damp in me that I chose to return by sea, although dangerous rather than go through the same scene again. And I am since informed that many villages are near to depopulated and the mortality still raging, so that if God in his mercy does not put a stop to our community, we are an undone nation. Last year's frost is felt more severe here than in other countries, having destroyed the potatoes, which are the chief support of the poor, in such a manner that the same quantity we used to buy for two pence and half penny is now sold under ten pence, and they are not that good. It has given to our trade and manufacturers by which the poor tradesmen who by their daily labour used to live well are now turned off work and have no other way to subsist than by begging. Beggars were always too plenty here, but are now much increased, that I believe by a modest computation there cannot be less than one to every ten houses. Their numbers make it impossible for all to get relief, and as markets still rise, the apprehensions of great calamity do increase. Good beef is five pence, mutton three pence, and butter eight pence per pound, bread and corn in proportion, and if other countries do not relieve us with corn, we can expect nothing but a perfect famine, our harvest having mostly failed last year. Advertisement from the Newcastle Current, October 1739, warning. Whereas several gentlemen and others have of late and still continue to come into the barony of Gisland, belonging to the Right Honourable the Earl of Carlisle, to hunt, shoot and kill the game, with the said barony. These are to give notice that the, the said earl hath given strict orders to his gamekeepers to take care of and preserve the game within the said liberty and to prosecute all persons that shall kill game there without his lordship's license. This case was considered astonishing as a ten-year-old boy attempts to kill his whole family. The boy had been taken in as an orphan. From the Kentish Weekly Post or Canterbury Journal, March 1738, unparalleled premeditated villainy of his boy. 
I here give you a melancholy account of the misfortunes of Lieutenant Amherst, occasioned by the unparalleled premeditated villainy of his boy, Isaac Provender, whom he took in to his family upon charity. This young rascal, upon the 19th of April last, at four in the morning, got out of his bed, took a brand's end from the kitchen fire, went directly to the cowhouse, which adjoined to Mr. Amherst's dwelling house, and there set fire to a load of hay, which in a few minutes burst into a flame that catched hold of the house, and in less than two hours consumed it to the ground with all its most valuable goods and furniture. Having left all that was above stairs in his store's house and cellar with all his own clothes and the best part of Mrs. Ham Amherst's, it was with some difficulty they escaped with their own lives, the house being in flame before they could get out of their beds, and in the hurry Mr. Amherst was wounded in the foot by the end of a spit, which in the confusion was thrown out of doors. The wretch of a boy soon confessed to all, without any seeming concern, and likewise acknowledged he once intended to cut his master's and mistress's throats, but was afraid of being discovered. His Majesty's Council, being the only civil court in the province, met to consult what was to be done in such an extraordinary case, and, after two days' deliberations, resolved to keep him in jail till they have an opportunity of writing to Boston to advise them with some lawyers on how to dispose of him. And, indeed, the circumstances are so great, and the circumstances attending it so odious, that people of the soundest judgments must be at a loss how to inflict a punishment to his guilt, even if he was of years, but especially considering his non-age being but ten years and a few months old, which I am afraid will protect him from the rigour of the law. I am persuaded very few counties in any age can produce instances of this kind, if all is duly considered. For when he first entertained a notion of cutting his master's and mistress's throats, he confessed he had not the courage to attempt it, but then he thought he might easily destroy the maidservant, and on one night actually got out of bed, went down to the kitchen, groped about for a knife, and finding none, he began to repent, as he himself expressed it, and so slept by the kitchen fire all the rest of the night. These diabolical projects having failed, he thought of burning the house, which he unhappily accomplished, and to prevent being discovered or even suspected after he had set fire to the hay, went directly to bed, and when the alarm was given, came down the stairs quite naked in a pretended fright leaving clothes behind him, alleging that he had no time to bring them down. In a word, he both acted and confessed his horrid and almost unheard of villainy like a true devil, without the least change in his countenance or any appearance of remorse, giving no other reason for it than being reproved and slightly corrected for several mischievous tricks which he had Committed. Advertisement from the Newcastle Current, October 1739, published. The third edition of the Modern Cook, containing instructions for preparing and ordering public entertainments for the tables of princes, ambassadors, noblemen, and magistrates. Also, the least expensive methods of providing for private families in a very elegant manner. New recipes for the dressings of meat, fowl and fish, and making ragouts, fricassees, and pastry of all sorts in a method never before published. Adorned with copper plates exhibiting the orders of placing the different dishes, etc., on the table 
in the most polite way by Mr. Vincent Le Chapelle, late chef, cook to the Right Honourable the Earl of Chesterfield, and now chief cook to His Highness the Prince of Orange. Agony Aunt Corner Letter 1 From Distress I have the misfortune to be married to a man who spends his life in a regular course of irregularity. It makes no conscience of disturbing me every night at unreasonable hours. He is always the last man in the club room, and when he comes home he reels into the room, talks aloud for a, a quarter of an hour, and then reigns himself to the sweetest repose which he has so effectively banished from his wife. I seldom see him from noon until after midnight, but I'm left to pass my evenings unless relieved by an accidental visit in the entertaining conversation of a maiden aunt who lives with us. I have proposed separate beds, but he will hear none of it. I beg you now whether I may not consider myself as unmarried and endeavour to lighten the conjugal load, as I see most of my neighbours do, and as I am deprived of my husband's company, admit that of somebody else, for positively I can bear this treatment no longer. P.S. There is very pretty gentleman who wants to come and chat a few evenings with me. What? Would you advise? Answer. Too distressed. Before I advise this lady, I must beg leave to say a word to her husband and to desire him to consider that if a sentinel will leave his post, he cannot wonder at finding it occupied by another. I sincerely pity her, and if she could punish her husband, without hurting herself, I should not blame her. In the meantime, I think the maiden aunt being with her a happy circumstance, and I am glad to find we are sometimes of use. I can only recommend her a certain quality which I have observed to be of real service in the conjugal life. I mean patience or she will certainly find the remedy she proposed much worse than the disease. Letter 2. What is more unhappy than an ugly old maid? Answer. It is possible for a handsome young maid to be more unhappy than an ugly old one. Letter 3. Sir, supposing you to be a person of general knowledge, I make my application to you on a particular occasion. I have a great mind to be rid of my wife, and I hope, when you consider my case, you will be of an opinion that I have pretensions to a divorce. I am a mere man of the town, and have very little improvement, but what I have got, I've got from plays. I remember in the silent woman, the learned Dr. Bird, or Dr. Otter, I forget which, makes one of the causes of separation to be error personae. When a man marries a woman and finds her not to be the same woman who he intended to marry, but another, if that be law, it is, I presume, exactly my case. For you are to know Mr. Spectator, that there are women who do not let their husbands see their faces till they are married. Not to keep you in suspense, I mean plainly that part of the sex who paints. There are some of them so exquisitely skilful this way, not to give but a tolerable pair of eyes to set them up with, and they will make bosom lips, cheeks, and eyebrows by their own industry. Ask for, my dear, never was man so enamoured as I was of her fair forehead, neck, and arms, 
as well as the bright jet of her hair. But to my great astonishment, I find there were all the effects of art. Her skin is so tarnished with this practice that when she first wakes up in the morning, she scarce seems young enough to have been the mother of her whom I carried to bed the night before. I shall take the liberty to part with her by the first opportunity, unless her father will make her portion suitable to her real, not to her assumed, countenance. This I thought fit to let him and her know by your means. Answer. I cannot tell what the law is or what the parent of the lady will do for this injured gentleman, but I must allow he has very much justice on his side. Advertisement from the Stamford Mercury, January 1738, Beast Market. Notice is hereby given that a beast market will be held weekly on Saturday at Northampton, all the spring of the year, from the Saturday after twelve days till St. George. The beasts are to stand on the wood hill and around All Hallows churchyard wall, where nothing is to be paid or taken for the stands, and so to continue and be held weekly every spring of the year in the like manner. Vintage victuals. Today's recipes come from a range of publications. Gooseberry Vinegar A recipe to make gooseberry vinegar many degrees better than any we have abroad and which makes better punch than oranges or any other fruit. To every gallon of cold water put six pounds of ripe gooseberries. Bruise them in a stone mortar with a wooden pestle, then pour the water on them in a cask. Then let the cask stand in a warm place near the fire or in the sun till the liquor ferments and the fruit gets all up top on the top, which will be about a fortnight. Then take it out and strain the berries from the liquor, which liquor you must then put in the same cask and add to every gallon of it one pound of brown sugar, after which it will ferment a second time. And when you see it hath done working, stop up the vessel close, and six months' time it will be fit to use. But if you have it near a fire or in a warm place, it will be fit much sooner, and the vinegar will be better. Queen of Scots Soup the Queen of Scots soup is made in a manner following. Six chickens are cut into small pieces, with the heart, gizzard and liver well washed, and then put into a stew pan, and just covered with water and boiled till the chickens are enough. Season it with salt and cayenne pepper, and mince parsley with eight egg yolks and the whites beat up together. Stir round all together, just as you are going to serve it up. Half a minute will boil the eggs. The sweet stuff. Bride's pie. Having boiled two calves' feet, take the meat from the bones and chop it very small. Take a pound of beef suet and a pound of apples and shred them small. Clean and pick a pound of currants and dry them before the fire. Stone and chop a quarter of jar raisins, a quarter of mace and nutmeg, two ounces of candied citron, the same of lemon peel cut thin, a glass of brandy and champagne. Put it in a china dish with a rich puff pastry over it. Roll another lid and cut it in leaves, flowers and figures and put a glass ring in it. Christmas Mince Pies Take a large bullock's tongue and let it lie 24 hours in salt. Take the finest part of it with three pounds of beef suet. 
three pounds of raisins stoned, the same quantity of currants cleaned, and half a dozen of apples pared, having minced them separately. Take half a pound of citron and a pound of orange peel and cut them small and put the whole into a broad vessel. Beat half an ounce of Jamaica pepper, a quarter of an ounce of cloves, two nutmegs, the grate of two large lemons and two teaspoonfuls of salt. Mix them amongst the minced meat. Squeeze the juice of three lemons into a quart of white wine and pour it on the meat and then mix it all well together. Press it down into a can and paper up the mouth of it. When you have an occasion to use it, cover some patty pass with puff paste and fill them up with it nicking the upper crust with a knife. Tattle Tales Gossip Corner this story is quite interesting in that it is dripping with sarcasm regarding a countryman who believes he is facing a witch. The government at the time was trying very hard to retract from the witch scares that had occurred under King James I, 1603 to 1625, but many of these beliefs still remained in the countryside. From the Derby Mercury, January 1738, Favisham, murder of a suspected witch. A barbarous murder was lately committed on Jane Plain by Stephen Diper, one of the most stupid villains that ever was formed with human shape, of which this story is as follows. Mr James Bunce of Offspring near Favisham gives annually every St. Thomas's Day, a certain measure of wheat to every poor woman that comes and asks for the same. Among the number was Jane Plain, a poor woman of unblemished character, aged between sixty and seventy years, who was ordered by Mr. Bunce to have the measure. The villain who was ordered to measure the corn took it into his head that this poor creature was a witch, and bethought himself of a stratagem which he had heard to know them by. This was that no witch had power to receive more than a measure, which proved to be the death of this innocent creature, for her modesty was so great that she told him, as seeing the heap measure, that his master did not allow it, nor did she desire more than he was willing to give. This and this only urged on her fate, for she no sooner refused, but he drew his knife and stabbed her, as I informed, in over forty places. Mr. Bunce was in the room at the same time with the child in his arms and two others by his side, not knowing where the villain would stop. His first care was to secure the children, then calling three others of his servants, went and seized the ruffian who gloried in the action. Who was being executed or pilloried for an afternoon's entertainment or transported was always a topic of gossip in every village. The rollout impact was the respectability of the remaining family members and the possibility of picking up goods at auction at rock-bottom prices. The difference on the sentence of the very young girl is due to her having killed her master. That law also included killing a husband, as he would legally be considered her master. From the Kentish Weekly Post or Canterbury Journal, March 1738, sentencing from the Assizes. On Thursday last, the Assizes ended at Winchester, when the four following persons received sentences of death. Mary Troke for poisoning her master, John Boyd and John Ward for several robberies on the highway, and James Warwick for horse-stealing. James Boyd and James Warwick are to be executed next Saturday fortnight, and Mary Toke, who is a girl under 16 years of age, 
is to be burnt at the same time. Job Ward was reprieved by the judges before they left the city. There was a great intercession made of the girl, but to no purpose. As me medical care could be scarce and possibly not effective, the papers at the time were filled with all types of recipes to fix or repair any number of complaints either for people or for animals. These types of recipes were much more prevalent than cooking recipes, unless it was to make wine. We include this recipe as an example. From the Kentish Weekly Post or Canterbury Journal, March 1738, for the cure of the bite of a mad dog. Take of native cinnabar and factitious cinnabar, both ground to an exceedingly fine powder, each twenty four grains. Of the strongest musk, sixteen grains, and you rub these together till the musk is also become very fine, and give it all for a dose in a small teacup full of arak or brandy as soon as possible after a person is bit, and another dose thirty days later. But if a person has the symptoms of madness come on before he has had the medicine, he must take two doses in an hour and a half. Note, as on occasion for giving the medicine may possibly happen amongst some people who are at a loss to manage in any difficulty, it may not be amiss to subjoin the manner of getting it down. When a person is becoming raving mad and refuses to swallow any liquid, which is that he must be held down on his back and have his nostrils pinched close together, by which means the medicine may be forced down by a little at a time out of a spoon without any waste. We end this episode with this wonderful tale of a man who has locked himself in his home to avoid debt collectors and who shoots at anyone who approaches his door. From the Derby Mercury, January 1739, captured. On Thursday last, Captain Draper, who had fortified himself in the Assembly House at St Edmunds in Bury against his creditors, and the civil magistrate for about a month past, firing frequently out of his windows at passengers and terrifying the whole town, was besieged by a party of twenty-four dragoons detached for that purpose from Norwich, and after a blockade of twenty-four hours, surrendered to the commanding officer and was by him put into the hands of the magistrate, who sent him to the prisoner to the castle to the great joy of the borough. That concludes this episode of Vintage Voices 1738 to 1749. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be really grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. The likes and subscriptions help to keep our small channel alive. Do be sure to check out our community post on our channel page every Sunday which will tell you what episodes are coming up the following week. And if you have a liking for the darker side of Georgian, Victorian and Edwardian stories, check out our sister channel, News of the Times. The link is on our channel page and below. Thank you again, everyone. See you next time. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>